thank you all for coming here this morning. I know it's been a bit of a crush to get in. We could have filled this hall several times over. There's such demand and such enthusiasm to go out there and campaign in this election. I want to say thank you to Marsha for the words that she just said. And she's quite right about the history of this wonderful place, the Battersea Arts Centre, Battersea Town Hall, that saw the election of John Archer of Sackleth Vala and of our good friend Martin Linton, who won it back from the Tories. And then Marsha herself winning the constituency in 2017 and becoming our shadowed shadow minister for people with disabilities, in which she's doing an incredible job. She speaks for people all around the country about the way in which universal credit and so many other horrible things affect people's lives. Marsha, thank you for everything that you do for our party. And I thank all of my colleagues in the Shadow Cabinet and the Shadow teams that are here today as well. They do an incredible job day in, day out, holding this government to account. And I'm proud of all of them being here today, supporting our party, our campaign, and our pledge to deliver for the people of this country. Thank you all very much indeed. And as we embark on this campaign, I say thank you to all of them for the personal friendship and support that's given all the time, because that's what our party is about, people campaigning and working together. Today, we launch the most ambitious and radical campaign our country has ever seen, to bring real change to all parts of this country. If you want to live in a society that works for everybody, not just the billionaires, if you want to save our hospitals, schools and public services from Tory cuts and privatisation. If you want to stop the big polluters destroying our environment, then this election is your chance to vote for it. The choice, the choice could not be clearer. We put our faith in the British people's spirit and commitment to community. It's your country. That's why we stand with you. Labour will put wealth and power in the hands of the many. Boris Johnson's Conservatives, who think they're born to rule, will only ever look after the privileged few. They've slashed taxes for the richest and slashed vital services and support for everyone else. But real change is coming. This election is a once in a generation chance to transform our country, to take on the vested interests that are holding people back and ensure that no community in any part of this country is ever left behind again. Some people, some people believe that real change isn't possible. They say we're asking too much. Really? Really? A health service that people can be proud of, where tens of thousands of cancer patients aren't waiting months for treatment and prescriptions are free throughout the country. Is that asking too much? Is it asking too much to have a social care system that doesn't leave our older people isolated and afraid, but instead gives them dignity with free personal care? Is that asking too much? How about a decent pay rise, a le real living wage, 
of at least 10 pounds an hour right away, including for young workers from the age of 16. Is that, is that asking too much? Asking too much to secure homes that families can afford, rents that don't break the bank, and an end to the disgrace and indignity of rough sleeping in every city of this country. Is that, is that too much to ask? 30 hours free childcare for all two to four year olds, all children together. A good, a good education from cradle to grave as a right, not a privilege. And an end to tuition fees at university. Is that too much? Ending, ending the Conservatives' great rip-off by putting rail, mail and water into public ownership. So, those vital services work for everyone, not just Tory donors and shareholders in tax havens. Is that asking too much? No. What about real action on the climate crisis? Yes. By creating hundreds of thousands of new green energy jobs in communities everywhere where they're most desperately needed. I don't, I don't think any of those things are asking too much because we have to radically change course now to avoid living on a hostile and dying planet. This election is our last chance to tackle the climate emergency with a green industrial revolution which is absolutely at the centre and the heart of Labour's plan to transform Britain. Yay. <laughs> Friends, today is the 31st of October. <laughs> it's all right, I'm just, just passing on information to you at this stage. The day that Boris Johnson promised we would leave the EU. He also said he would rather be dead in a ditch than delay beyond today. But he has failed, and that failure is his alone. You can't, you can't trust the word. After three long years of Brexit division and failure from the Tories, we have to get this issue sorted out, as Marsha pointed out. We need to take it out of the hands of politicians and trust the people to have the final say. Labour will get Brexit sorted within six months. We'll let the people decide whether to leave on a sensible deal or remain. It really isn't that complicated. <clears throat> and we, a Labour government, will carry out whatever the people decide so we can then get on with delivering the real change that Britain needs after years of Conservative cuts to vital services and tax handouts to the richest. <laughs> Labour, 
Labour is determined to bring a divided country together, while the Tories and the Liberal Democrats only seek to divide us further. The Liberal Democrats want to cancel a democratic vote with a parliamentary stitch-up, and Boris Johnson's planned trade deal with Trump will mean yet more National Health Service money taken away from patients and handed to shareholders. Despite his denials, the NHS is up for grabs by US corporations in a one-sided Trump trade sellout. Yeah. Channel 4 dispatches, Channel 4 dispatches revealed this week that the cost of drugs and medicines has repeatedly been discussed between the US and British trade officials. Remember Johnson's famous promise of 350 million a week for the NHS? Well, his toxic Brexit trade deal with Trump could hand over 500 million a week of NHS money to big drug corporations in America and around the world. We will stop them. Labour won't let Donald Trump get his hands on our National Health Service. NHS, our NHS, created by our communities and brave people that campaigned in centres like this to get an NHS, I simply say quite bluntly to everyone, it's not for sale. I think we're all agreed on that. That's so loud, that'll be heard everywhere, thank you. Johnson's sellout deal would lead to years of continuing negotiations and uncertainty. Labour will get Brexit sorted by giving the people the final say in six months. Britain needs to get beyond Brexit and, a deal, and deal with the damage done to our communities by a decade of Tory cuts and economic failure. I travel all around the country all the time. I meet hundreds of people in different circumstances, schools, colleges, factories, offices, community centres, health centres, lots of places. I meet people from all walks of life and I listen to them. I listen to them all the time. That's what our party is about, listening to people. And that is what I learn from them. You don't see politics like the media and political classes do. After a decade when real wages have fallen, for too many people, what they see is the community they love and love living in being run down through years of deliberate neglect. The evidence of a decade of economic vandalism is all around them. It's there. In the high streets, in small towns, with boarded up shops. It's there, in the closed library and swimming pool. The youth centres that close their doors. The high streets that are like a ghost town. The elderly couple who are scared to walk down their road because violent crime has doubled. The army veteran sleeping under blankets in a doorway people struggling to make ends meet. The mother and her children eating from a food bank because they've been forced onto universal credit. That's the evidence of conservative cuts. Well, I say no more. 
So, it will be Labour that will end the damaging Tory austerity and a Labour government that will scrap universal credit. <laughs> we will tear down the barriers to success that the Conservatives have put in people's way. We will invest in every nation and region, rebuild our public services, and give our NHS, our schools and the police the money they need by taxing those at the top properly to fund services for everyone else. <clears throat> we will give people back their pride in their communities and give everybody the quality of life that they deserve. And by everybody, I mean everybody. <clears throat> The prime, <clears throat> the prime Minister wants you to believe that we're having this election because Brexit is being blocked by an establishment elite. He's a man of much imagination. Um, <laughs> people aren't fooled so easily. They know the Conservatives are the establishment elite. <clears throat> And you, know what <clears throat> and you know what really scares the elite? All of us, the people of this country. What the elite are actually afraid of is paying their taxes. So, in this election, I think they're going to fight harder and dirtier than ever before. They'll throw everything at us because they know we are not afraid to take them on. So, we are going after the tax dodgers, we're going after the dodgy landlords, we're going after the bad bosses, we're going after the big polluters, because we know whose side we, the Labour Party, are on. <clears throat> and the big question in this election is, Whose side are you on? Are you on the side? Are you on the side of the tax dodgers who are taking us all for a ride? People who think it's okay to rip people off and hide their money in tax havens so they can have a super new yacht? Or are you on the side of the children with special education needs who aren't getting the support they deserve because of Tory and Lib Dem? government cuts. Whose side are you on? The dodgy landlords like the Duke of Westminster, Britain's youngest billionaire who tried to evict whole blocks of flats where families live to make way for luxury apartments, or the millions of tenants in Britain who struggle to pay their rent each month. Whose side are you on? The, the bad bosses like Mike Ashley, the billionaire who won't pay his staff properly and is even running Newcastle United into the ground. Or his exploited workforce, like the woman who was reportedly forced to give birth in a warehouse toilet because she was terrified of missing her shift. Whose side are you on? The big polluters like Jim Radcliffe, making Britain's richest man who makes his money by polluting the environment? Or the children growing up in our cities? with reduced lung capacity because of choking pollution. Whose side are you on? The greedy bankers like Chris, Crispin Odi, who makes millions betting against our country, and to show his generosity, has donated huge sums of money to Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. <laughs> or are you on the side of working people who create the wealth that's then squirreled away 
into those tax havens. And whose side are you on? The billionaire media barons like Rupert Murdoch, whose empire pumps out propaganda to support a rigged system. Or the overwhelming majority of our country who want to live in a decent, fair, diverse and prosperous society. You know whose side you're on. A Labour government will be on your side as well. <laughs> Together, together we can pull down a corrupt system and build a fairer country that genuinely does care for all. And we have something that the Rupert Murdochs, the Mike Ashleys and the Boris Johnsons of this world don't have. We have people, hundreds of thousands of people in every part of our country who will make this the biggest people-powered election campaign in the history of this country. We, we are young, we are old, we are black, we are white, we're straight, we're gay, we're women, we're men, we're people, of all faiths and none. We're from the North, we're from the South, we're from Scotland, we're from Wales, we're from every part of this country. And when Labour wins, the nurse wins, the pensioner wins, the student wins, the office worker wins, the engineer wins, we all win. Boris Johnson, I knew you'd sit down as soon as I mentioned the name. <laughs> Boris Johnson thought he was being smart, holding this election in a dark and cold December. He thinks he won't go out to vote. He thinks he won't go out to campaign. Well, I say this to him. Labour will be out there in every city every town and every village with the biggest and most confident campaign that our country has ever, ever seen. <laughs> bringing, bringing a message, a message of hope and change to every country and every community that makes up Britain. Even if the rivers freeze over, we're going out to bring real change for the many, not the few. And all we need, <coughs> all we need on those cold streets as we walk down them is the thought of removing Boris Johnson's Conservatives from government and the chance to rebuild and transform our country. This is the most radical and exciting plan for real change ever put before the British electorate. Friends, the future is ours to make together. It is now time for real change. Thank you.
now, and now the teacher takes over. Uh, good to see you. No class, you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, and, and I, follow my, that, my great, hey. My great, follow that. My great friend Selma, <laughs> who is a former head teacher, who has the most brilliant way of bringing a class together in school, <laughs> and she's brought the same skills to Parliament, <laughs> and she'll bring the same skills into government. <laughs> Jeremy, um, Thelma Walker, MP for Combe Valley in West Yorkshire. And what an inspirational speech that was, Jeremy. And that's the vision. And that's the vision we can deliver in a few weeks' time. Um, and I'm really proud to stand here supporting Jeremy and John McDonnell and all this wonderful team. Because we're going to deliver for our country. But now, um, Jeremy's going to take some questions, starting um, with um, the media. As has been said, I'm a former primary head teacher. <laughs> so I'm going to um, obviously be looking at people who are sitting up straight <laughs> with a sunny smile. OK? OK. So we're... <laughs> Uh, we're going to take them in groups, first of all, four questions, and uh, we're going to start with the BBC and Laura Kunzberg. And there is a roving, there is a, a roving mic. I've got um, it there, Laura. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hand, hands up straight in the air and smiles all around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Mr Corbyn, your pitch to the public today is very similar to in 2017. You improved your position then, but you didn't secure a majority. Why do you think two years on you might secure a majority with the same message. Okay. <laughs> we got that? Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> and can we have the mic for Beth Rigby Sky? Thank you. Um, Mr. Corbyn, in 2017, you defied your critics, but two years on, you have the lowest personal polling ratings of any opposition leader since 1977. How do you get the people out there to feel about you the way the people in this room do? And if you fall short and you don't win this election, will you stand aside? Okay, and have we got Libby Viner, ITN? At the mic there. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, you say that now you're the party that wants to give the people a final say. In that referendum, which way will you vote? Okay. <laughs> and finally in this group, have we got Andy Bell, 5 News? Hello. Um, Andy Bell, 5 News. Thanks very much. Um, Mr Corbyn, I want to ask you about the NHS, obviously a very important issue for your audience here as well. You're worried about privatisation. Can you just say, are you proposing to roll back that part of the NHS where the private sector already provides services for thousands and thousands of people? Um, do you want to roll that back as well and essentially end provision by the private sector in the NHS for good? Okay, Jeremy, okay. you're on those. <clears throat> thank, you, thank you all for the questions. Um, Laura, thanks for your questions. Um, it is a pitch to the public which we are putting there with pride and with confidence about the kind of society that we can achieve. We've had two years of this government. We've had now three Tory prime ministers since I became leader of the Labour Party. And the successive Tory governments of Cameron, May and Johnson have been defeated 48 times in Parliament during that period. The biggest number of defeats any government has ever suffered. We will put forward a manifesto which is written by the people that I've met and many, many others in our party and affiliates. And we will put that message out there. And we're very well prepared for this election campaign and going to go out there and do it. And in response to Beth's question, <clears throat> 
It's not about me. It's not about any individual on this platform. It's not a presidential election. We <clears throat> It is about each and every one of us who are standing as Labour candidates, as Labour shadow cabinet, or any other position, with all the diversity that we've got and all the different ex life experiences we bring to this country and to our party and to our parliament. And so, I'm very happy to go out there on this election campaign. I'll be all over the country meeting people, listening to people, and taking that message there. And I ask our media, as good journalists, to just report what we say. <laughs> and uh, Libby, thanks for your question. Brexit has divided communities, people and families. Whether you voted remain and live here in Battersea and you're in the private rented sector and you're being forced onto universal credit and you've gone into debt as a result of it and you may have a zero hours contract job, you are totally up against it. If you live in Mansfield and you are living in the private rented sector you cannot get a job and you voted leave in the referendum. Your interests are actually absolutely the same in electing a government that will bring the people and the communities together. We have challenged this government over its behaviour and attitude on Brexit from the very beginning. We've inflicted defeats on them, and Keir and myself have been to Brussels many times to discuss all these issues with people there. And we believe that we have to take no deal off the table. And that is why, that is why I refuse to support any move that would allow Boris Johnson to take this country out without a deal until it was absolutely confirmed by all 28 of the member states that the extension had been granted. The extension was granted. We are now in the election campaign. We will go into office. We'll go into office and immediately open negotiations with the EU about a sensible relationship with Europe. One that doesn't destroy jobs in Sunderland, doesn't destroy jobs in South Wales or in Birmingham or in North Wales or all across the central belt of Scotland. A deal that would mean we would maintain trading relationship with Europe. We would have a customs union, which would mean that the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic would be what it is now, and the Good Friday Agreement would be intact. Yeah. <clears throat> and that the uh, option of a sweetheart trade deal with Donald Trump with all the dangers that offers would not be an option. And then, within six months, that offer, alongside Remain, would be put to the British people, and in the meantime, our party will come together in the way we always do, discuss that, and decide what we're going to do. But basically, it will be about bringing our communities together and putting the issue behind us because that will be the decision at that time. I'm looking forward to doing all of that and I believe it is a sensible and credible option. And our government, our Labour government, will carry out the wishes of the British people in government to decide on our relationship with Europe but also all the other issues I've talked about in poverty, investment, justice in this country. And, Andy, you mentioned the National Health Service. Well, there's £10 billion of our money going into the private sector now via the National Health Service. When you go to a hospital, 
you're sometimes uh, advised to go to the pharmacy and pick up some medicines. You go there and you speak to the staff there and you suddenly find they're not actually NHS employees. They're working for somebody else. I have to say they all want to be NHS employees. And then you find that the companies that are bidding for NHS contracts, if they don't get them, they then sue the NHS. I did invite Richard Branson to donate the money he's trying to make from suing the NHS to an appropriate charity. <clears throat> and I, sim I simply say this. John Ashworth has led our fight on the NHS, and I thank John for all of that and the work that he's done. And yes, I do want, I do want our NHS to be one where everyone delivering the services of the NHS are NHS employees, part of the family of NHS employees. Thank you, Jeremy. We'll take four more questions. Have we got Pippa Carrera from Mirror? Have we got Pippa here? Have we got yes, the mic? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Jeremy, um, can I ask you quickly, can you today... Um, can you pledge now that if you win the election that you'll serve all five years in office? And can I ask, um, you've railed against the elites in your speech, but lots of people in the sorts of seats that you need to both hang on to and win in other parts of the country think that you're the Islington elite. Are you? I'm the what? <laughs> Islington elite. <laughs> okay. And have we got uh, Henry Zeffnan from The Times? Henry? Uh, Hi there. Uh, you're here with your whole shadow cabinet today. If you win this election, can you confirm now that all of them are going to go into the corresponding jobs in government? So, for example, <laughs> Emily Thornberry, Foreign Secretary, <laughs> Tom Watson, Culture Secretary. And then have we uh, Heather Stewart from The Guardian. Hi, Jeremy. Um, your activists passed a number of very radical policies in Brighton last month at conference, which they'll now hope, which they'll now hope to see in a Labour manifesto. Will a Labour government abolish Eton, the school that gave us Boris Johnson? <laughs> OK, and finally in this group, uh, Torquil Crichton, uh, Daily Record. Jeremy Topper Clyden, Daily Record. You spoke uh, passionately about taxes there and people paying taxes. You publish your tax return. Do you think other political leaders should publish theirs in this campaign? Yeah. I'm speaking. Okay. All right, we're not. Thanks, Pepper, <coughs> for your question about elites in. Oh, oh, oh sorry. I beg your pardon. Sorry. Speaking of political sorry, leaders. Sorry. When did you last speak to Nicola Sturgeon and what did you discuss? <laughs> all right. S sorry, I didn't... I thought you'd finished. Okay. Um, first of all, Pippa, thank you for your question about elites. I have said a great deal about wealthy elites and where they put their money in tax havens and you very generously pivoted that straight away to the London Borough of Islington. <laughs> I can't imagine why. <clears throat> Look... I'm the Member of Parliament for Islington North, and I have been since 1983, and I'm very, very proud to be the MP for Islington North, and very proud to represent the people there. Whatever you might think about my borough, whatever image you might have of my borough, almost 40% of the children of my borough are living in poverty. A third of the community are living in the private rented sector. People are terrified of going on to universal credit, because they know the poverty and the misery that it could give them. We have a council that's doing its very best to build housing, doing its very best to deliver services, but has had its budget absolutely slashed by the Lib Dem and Conservative coalition government. Don't run away with media images put forward by property developers. The reality is my community, like every other community, <clears throat> My community, like every other community in the country, has people who are totally up against it. My job as their MP is to do my very best to represent them, and I do that with pleasure and with honour. And 
I have been proud to represent the constituency all these years, and I will carry on doing that. And whatever position I've ever held, I've always worked flat out to represent the people that have elected me in the first place. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the question about um, the Shadow Cabinet and all the others. Um, it really would not be appropriate to decide on the appointments and makeup of the next Labour government on this platform here today, but I do thank you for your advice. It's, it's gratefully received. <coughs> and um, if you're concerned about me and um, how I'm going to carry on, well, I tell you this, I love doing this job, I love meeting people, I love campaigning, and above all, I'll be so proud to lead a Labour government that ends universal credit, that builds the council houses we need. <clears throat> because that is what our movement is all about. When I joined the Labour Party, in the 1960s. I joined it because I wanted to see a better society and a more peaceful world. I wanted to see justice in our world and our society. And nothing of my beliefs has changed during that period. I want that justice, I want that, that peaceful world, and I want decency in our society. That is what motivates me. <clears throat> And as to, the, um, as to the tax return question, there are two people who publish their tax returns, in my opinion, and that is the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Prime Minister. I'm not sure they do, but John McDonnell and I do publish our tax returns in full. In fact, the first time my tax return was published, they realised, well, after they'd managed to read my handwriting, that actually I'd been over generous and given the Inland Revenue £300 more than I should have done. But that's okay, I don't want it back, it's fine. Um, and um, on the question of Nicola Sturgeon, I last had a discussion with Nicola Sturgeon about 10 days ago, and I do keep in touch with obviously political leaders around the country um, because that is what leading the party is all about. You know what? When we go into government, it's going to be so much different and so much better because we'll have a different world and a different society and a government that doesn't try and divide people but instead tries to bring them together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, sorry, on the, the que sorry, Heather, your question. Uh, sorry, Heather, your question. Um, the manifesto is being written, but I simply say this, the policies that were discussed at conference will be discussed at what we call our Clause 5 meeting, which will decide the contents of the manifesto. And for starters, we will definitely be making sure that all those um, private schools, public schools as they call themselves, will actually have to pay their taxes in a fair and proper way. <laughs> take some questions from the audience now so if anybody in the audience has um, a question um, second row lady in the white shirt um, local thank you very much for your speech um, local government budgets have been absolutely decimated I'm a local councillor here in Battersea and our community has felt the devastating impact particularly our youth clubs like Devas and Keys, who the council, where the council have cut their dedicated youth workers. Youth workers provide invaluable mentoring to our vulnerable teenagers. Will the next mm. Labour government invest in our young people? Okay, any... Uh, the man in the black T-shirt, third... Yeah. Hi, I'm Anthony, a 17-year-old youth club, um, and 
one of the things that I've noticed in the time I've been teaching is the um, absolute damage that school cuts have done to our students. So I've seen our students' mental health decline time and time again. We refer them to services. They say they're oversubscribed. They can't support our children. Our school buildings are falling down. Head teachers have to make a decision. Do we fix the roof or do we hire a teacher? They have fundamentally let down our young people. Um, my real question to you is, how will the Labour government fix our education system and move it away from rote learning and kind of memorization and actually create young people that stand for our, and stand for our country? Well, that's one more. Gentleman at the end of the row there, yes. Cabinet, uh, most of the shadow cabinet, there is a very, very crying question with which you must react with urgency and accuracy it demands because you are present. This question is about what they established yesterday in The Guardian about NOS, Israeli company, you know that, which has worked with the Google and uh, Facebook by which our innocent discussion or talking to our friends around this has become, has become the gold, the gold by which all these companies become, become rich. Okay? So this exploitation around this thing, and the problem is it is one point billion people they represent in the world. Facebook is present. And please, please, if you do something, individuals like here and the rest of the are suffering, you're representing people, please try to represent 1.2 billion people in this, in internationally, of which we in the third world are constantly victims, of which me, I am who I am, not what I am, you are a third world, because I have experienced this serious matter. Okay. You know that very well, and everybody knows that, because I am who I am by other people, not what I am, as I describe myself. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, thanks for your question. First of all, from a councillor here in Battersea concerning the youth service. Um, young people often get a very bad press, and um, they then feel a sense of isolation and dislocation from society. And uh, the loss of youth centres the underfunding of schools, meaning there's fewer after-school activities. The overpricing of often publicly owned sports facilities means there's a whole exclusion that's happening there. And the high cost of any sort of private entertainment also means that young people are increasingly dislocated from the world in which they are growing up. And that should not be the case. We should be cherishing, supporting our young people. And so, some local authorities, despite all the cuts and austerity, have managed to maintain youth services of some sort. All of them are stretched and all of them are strained. I want to say thank you to youth workers all over the country for what they do. Detached youth workers and ones that are located in... <coughs> in, com <coughs> in <coughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> it's all right, there's only seven weeks to go. <coughs> <laughs> But, uh, so a Labour government would, would make the provision of youth services a statutory duty on all local authorities and ensure that those services are properly funded, be, be they youth centre, adventure playground or whatever else it happens to be. Because, as I said in my speech, there's something poignant and disgraceful about seeing a youth centre boarded up and closed and young people sort of playing outside and kicking a football against its doors. That's the image of Tory Britain. That's what it's really about. So we will properly fund the youth service all across the country. And the point our friend the teacher made about school funding is so true that um, I didn't realise that uh, Tories were so in love with um, George Orwell's language, but when they, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, the former Secretary of State for Education, announced that they were going to bring in a fair funding formula for schools, I thought, oh, okay. I thought, well, that sounds that's nice. Okay. So fair funding, that sounds reasonable. Fair funding, what? Fair funding, my eye. 
It was cut after cut after cut and head teachers being told to raise the money from somewhere else. And so head teachers go through the stress of deciding, as you quite rightly said, whether to fix the roof or employ a teacher or try and see if the parents can raise any money. And all of us as MPs, we do our best to support our local schools. And I go to school fairs and so on, as all MPs do. And the difference in them is so amazing. You get a school fair in a relatively prosperous area that raises five or 10,000 pounds on one go on a, on a summer afternoon. And then you go to a school in a poorer area where they're lucky to raise 500 quid. And then the whole differences kick in. As far as I'm concerned, school fairs are great, wonderful, fantastic, but they shouldn't be there for funding mainstream education. That is the duty. <coughs> That is the duty of the public. And Angela, Angela and I have talked very, Angela Rayner and I have talked often about how our National Education Service will change things, take the commodity out of education and insert the right. But it's also about the stresses and strains that children are under. Again, the inequality kicks in. All children are imaginative and creative and love music and dance and learning and poetry and art. Some get the chance to do it because their parents can afford to buy them a violin, buy them a trombone, a guitar, whatever else. Others don't get that chance. Some schools are supported, like in Liverpool, where Liverpool Philharmonic do great work in supporting school. Others are not. Tom and I, others, others have discussed this. What we will do is introduce a pupil arts premium for every school so that every child gets to learn music while they're in school. <clears throat> but it's also, it, it's also about the, um, the strain on children of this very competitive education system. So we want to restore the family of education into a community where the local education authority has the influence to bring all the schools together, to work together. Because league tables are great things. I mean, I'm an Arsenal supporter, I love league tables. But, <laughs> but it's all right, that was, meant, that, was not, that was not meant to be a divisive comment. Um, but it simply doesn't work where education is concerned. And what you find is the stress and strain on the students, on the teachers, is very, very difficult indeed. The rising numbers of school exclusions, which I believe are in part related to that, as the Select Committee report has pointed out, and I, and I thank Thelma for the work that she put into that. And so we've looked at this a lot and we've learned from other countries as well. And so our proposal is that we will end Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 testing in our schools. <laughs> and instead give teachers the power and the influence to... Uh, to um, see how their children and schools are getting on because teachers are under such pressure and such strain. We're losing people, young people, who've been through university in order to become a teacher, doing the job they really want to do and love. Then they find they're so ensnared with dictatorship and bureaucracies and everything else that they leave the profession they love. We have a huge shortage of teachers. So I want to create a welcoming atmosphere in the whole education world. Teaching should be the greatest pleasure and job ever. And that's why Thelma is doing so well in Parliament, because she was such a great teacher. And so education is, to me, an absolute priority, and we will work in the way that I've indicated, and our manifesto will reflect all of that. Thank you for your question about the behaviour of British countries, companies in other parts of the world and their behaviour. We have um, obviously laws, and we'll make those laws even stronger, about the way companies behave in this country, but that doesn't give them licence to exploit people in other parts of the world. And so, I've been talking with Barry and others about the trade policy we will adopt, which will respect environmental standards, which will respect human rights, and will be, yes, difficult. Lots of these things are difficult, but you don't go down a road to change the world and change society without expecting a few difficulties down the way. But it's our determination to achieve that change. And so, can I say thank you to all of you for being here today. Thank you for your support. But above all, thank you for the effort you're going to put in to elect a Labour government in Britain. <laughs>